So I'm about to go off to see Five Nights at Freddy's and... <laughs> Guess what? It's Mac, otherwise known as Mr. Gary Boy One. Yes. Is that right? All right, all right, all right. Uh, we got it's 10:13, so we got 17 minutes before the start time. But we, but the movies never start on time anyway. So no. yeah, any uh, quick thoughts before we get going? I'm interested to see what aspects they bring from the move from the games to the movie, and potentially what uh, they bring from the books. Because I'm a Five Nights at Freddy's fan. I don't think you are. I play. I'm. I'm. I think you're definitely the bigger fan. But yeah, I've uh, watched some playthroughs, and I'm actually going through the games myself. And I'm familiar with the lore, like who William Afton is, and Afton Robotics, and the whole and all that jazz. And also, I'm going to call it now. Steve Little is William Afton because if the guy in the trailer who was the employment. Okay. Yeah, that guy. Because if you've seen the first Scream movie, then. Well, I don't think you have, have you? No. Well, I've, then, seen, I've seen the Scooby-Doo movie. Okay, well, once, well, that's that one movie you got to watch this Halloween is the Scream movies. 1996, Nev Campbell, classic. Directed by Wes, Wes Craven. But uh, that's enough rambling for now. We're going to pump him some tunes, and we'll talk to you later. Time for the Five Nights at Freddy's theme. Thank you. Any last thoughts before we head in? Trap. So, what are what are our first thoughts? Pretty good. I really like the uh, different um, animatronics they used. Mm -hmm. the, the costuming and set design was also really good. I also like like the different um, references from like the various media. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember seeing something about Matt Pat being in it. Yeah. And I noticed his name tag was an S. Yeah. Which might just be a, which could just be completely coincidental. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna like to think it's um, referencing his Ness, his San, Ness's Sans theory. Oh my word. But yeah, I, the costumes were really well designed. Um, I won't get into spoilers, but that you know that bit on the third or fourth night, you know, when they, you know. That kind of killed the tension a bit, but a that ending, bit. that, that the, the ending though, redeemed it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very much so. Yeah, yeah. proper review. Yeah, I'll be doing a proper video on it, and I assume you will be, be too. Maybe. Like, be in it, or no, do like a review. Own... Yeah, do your own thing, I guess. Oh, the movies are your thing. <laughs> the games, movies, we kind of intersect. Yeah. That is the only time they use the iconic scream in the entire movie. <laughs> yeah, actually, you're right. You want to go first or shall I? I guess this is just our general thoughts on the movie. I knew who Michael Afton was. No, Michael Afton. That, no, no, that's Michael. We know, I know who Michael Afton is. But, um, I was going to say, he's not Michael Afton in this one. He's like Mike, Mike Smith. Smith. Yeah, Mike Schmidt. But I knew who William Afton was the moment I knew who was playing him. I mean, now, I've said this probably a thousand times, but if you've seen the original Scream movie, it's it becomes as clear as day. Like, you look at them and it's like, yep, yeah, Matthew Little, that's the character he's playing. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you mind if I turn on the light because you're very dark? Oh, that's all right. Just, just rest. Yeah. But, um, we're all gonna die. Give me, even though it was a PG-13, they still managed to get away with quite a bit. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't overly graphic, but at the same time, it was definitely, you could tell it was a not for kids movie. Yeah. Like you said, you were surprised that they had a, they were say words like shit and asshole in there. Yeah, I was very surprised by that because like, when I'm writing a script, I try to, like obviously mine is video games, so I try to relate it to like, a uh, PG-13 movie if it's like a teens game mm -hmm. so like I'm very reserved on like the swearing mm -hmm. and I usually don't like I think my current script doesn't even have any swears in it mm -hmm. so yeah it's just one of those things that I uh, just don't really think about as uh, a PG-13 thing like hell and damn is basically the most I would do yeah and Hell and Damn aren't really considered worse all that bad. In fact, believe it or not, there are some really old G-rated films that you probably you can find Hell and Damn in there. Yeah, I'd, I'd believe it. I was hoping we'd see more of, you know, Mike actually doing his job and trying to, you know, do some of the more classic Five Nights at Freddy stuff, but 
I also realized that that formula isn't exactly something that translates the best to film. Yeah, I was 100% uh, convinced, even from the get-go, that they weren't going to go that path. I thought they were going to try to do something similar to, like, Sister Location, where it's, like, something different every night kind of deal. Uh -huh. And just, like, it's just something interesting that just always comes up as, like, Mike's newest obstacle. It kind of worked that way, but also kind of not for a few nights. I also was surprised that it had a, quite a bit of heart to it as well. Yeah. I don't, and uh, Josh Hutcherson, it was nice to see him in a, like a big name movie again. I mean, the last time I remember seeing him in a movie that had that kind of name caliber behind it was The Hunger Games. Like, That's where I remember him from. Yeah, he was Peter. Yes. I was like, I recognize you. Where do I recognize you from? Thank you for that. <laughs> there was a moment in the movie where I thought that Vanessa was actually going to be the killer because I know in Security Breach, she was the one who wore the rabbit suit. Yes. Vanessa is an interesting character in the games series. I didn't expect her to be Afton's daughter. Well, I think they had to change it because they couldn't have Mike be his son, Afton's son. Yeah. I mentioned earlier how there was a bit that I uh, was it, that I thought kind of killed the tension, and that was the night where Abby was playing with them, and then they had they built the fort and all that. It's down here. Yeah. And I thought, okay, this what? And there were a couple kids like to I think to the left of us, and one of them I heard them say, "Oh man, it's not even scary anymore," and I had to agree with them. And that kind of killed the tension. A hundred percent. But at the same time, I think what redeemed it was the final act of the movie. I think that really, when they, when you had the pin drop moment of they want Dabby, it's like, oh, oh, wow, oh, no, I, oh, I forgot. These cute color things are actually murderers. I kind of like how they introduced the spring lock suits, if I'm being perfectly honest. Because, like, it's obviously not something that could be introduced supernaturally. Mm -hmm. It's like... There's two ways to do it, the way they did it, or someone losing an arm. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think the spring lock suit that they like showed that they wanted to put Abby in was kind of reminiscent of Baby in a way. Yeah, yeah. I thought it, actually I thought it was more of a reminiscent of the marionette from Five Nights at Freddy's 2. I can kind of see that. Oh, that moment where they had, where Max got bit in half? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was gruesome. Like, I'm surprised that, uh, even in Silhouette, that they did that. Yeah, and you saw the bottom half of a body drop in. Out. And, oh, on, on that another, or later on, where you see the dead bodies and you see that guy's face. Oh, oh yeah. Man, Again, this is a PG-13 rated movie, folks. Yeah, they've got away with some stuff. Never say that you can't get away with things in a PG-13 or that PG-13 is for babies. And also another point, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. That was another PG. I know it's not a horror or PG. Well, it is PG-13 or not a horror, but that is a violent movie. Uh, yeah. It can only got a PG here in Canada, where there's Five Nights at Freddy's has a 14A. For you non-Canadian viewers, 14A means anyone under the age of 14 cannot enter. But it's also the same rating that's given to movies like Oppenheimer, Killers of the Flower Moon, the DVD releases of Inception and 21 Jump Street. Like, the, like that, the that's a wide that, range. Yeah. I like the reoccurring gag of Balloon Boy jumping out, yeah. especially yeah. at the end. I wonder, although I think that might be a direct teaser for FNAF 2. Probably. But now, that does bring up the question, how are they going to go forward with this? Because Matthew Lillard mentioned in a podcast that that he signed a three-picture deal, which means we're very likely getting a trilogy. And I'm thinking if they go follow the logic of adapting every game, I'm going to drive around and then turn over and then okay. back to also so we can talk more. Yeah. Uh, but if we go by the order of the games, then we have FNAF, they'll adapt FNAF 2 and 3. And from my understanding, FNAF 2 is a prequel to FNAF 1, and FNAF 3 is a sequel that takes place years after the events of the original. Yeah, so FNAF... Uh... To for the five people who don't know is the prequel to the first game um takes place a decade or so before and FNAF 3 takes place about 30 years after the first game or after the first game or is it um it's just 30 years 
into the future at yeah, some point. Basically. And uh, which is gonna be interesting because if they follow the logic, like 10 years and 30 years in the, after the first, that means the second would take place in 1990 because as you saw, if you look closely on the security camera when Mike is at the, uh, I don't know what it was, the, not a jail, could career counseling office, it said the date year was 2000. Okay, because like I did, I actually didn't see that, but I was like speculating that it was like late nineties, early, very early two thousands. Yeah, yeah, like just so like the I was able to, well. I was somehow able to correctly guess the time frame. Yeah, but uh, if we if they do a prequel, I imagine it will be thirteen years in the past, and they will cover the bite of eighty seven. Because that is a huge, but it is a huge moment in the. FNAF it is, or, but I'm just imagining Mark Plyo saying, "Was, was that, that the bite of eighty seven? I, 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 I can tell you right now, well, if that happens in the movie, the, I, the entire, you're going to see an entire theater go, was that the bite of <laughs> Yes. And um, another, I think um, the right idea for this franchise, in my opinion, and also um, if they were to also follow that pattern of going to the past, then to the future, that would mean that FNAF 3 would technically take place in 2030. And if they were to release these movies every, let's say, two or three years, then it would be pretty close in terms of time yeah. memories. Uh, Funny enough you mentioned that, because uh, 2023 is actually in-game the year of FNAF 3. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh, what are the odds? All right, well, maybe they'll do, when they get round to FNAF 3, they'll set it in their, just the current year it comes out. Yeah. But uh, I th And I also think a good way forward would be Make the second one PG-13 as well, but then make the third one R. Because I imagine the kid, most of the people who are growing up with this movie, who are up the franchise, the likelihood is they're going to be old enough to see R-rated movies by themselves by the time the third one comes out. And based on my experience of what I know about the third game, it is very much a darker, or at least it seems to be a darker game than the last two. Uh, it's kind of, in lore-wise, a little... In actuality, gameplay, not overly, but um, it really kind of gets a lot darker with, like, FNAF 4. Oh, yeah, well, FNAF 4 has the most overtly scary ones with, like, the teeth and all that. Actually, that's a good point. We haven't mentioned, like, the them talking about dream theory throughout the beginning part of the movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was because isn't FNAF 4, like, supposedly taking place inside the mind of the kid who got bit in the... Well, it's now known as the Bite of 83, but we, it, but if you see Markiplier's playthrough of FNAF 4, when he goes, when that was that the Bite of 87? The speculation is that the kid who got bit, the entire game takes place in his dream for five nights as he's like in a hospital bed or something like that. Uh, that's actually the old theory. The current theory uh, is those nightmares are happening from Mike. Oh, that is interesting. That's interesting as well. But again, why... Mike is a child in that one, right? Yes. Hmm. I guess that could make sense. But, yeah, um, I don't think they'll adapt FNAF 4, or be mostly because, again, from my recollection, out of the main series, it's one of, if not the least favorite. Um, I could be wrong. Um, I just remember that people seem to love the first one and enjoy the second one. They like the third one, but the fourth one is kind of a tolerated like it's not as highly I, regarded as the other ones it's not but i think it's i think it's a bit more than you're giving it credit for here's a interesting like idea uh -huh. like we had abby as a kid in this one mm -hmm. if uh like the third movie for example as we mentioned earlier takes place like 30 years after what if she's in it as an adult and like she recalls having nightmares about the animatronics that could be that could work but um I don't know if they'll just keep on adapting all of the games. Oh, I was I was just going to sell it as a one-off reference. I think this first movie will be very much a standalone in that this is the only one with Mike Schmidt and Vanessa. I think in the sequel, we will go back to the past. to play, not, not to play the shitty games that suck ass, but to the, the Bite of 87. Because, again, it's a crucial moment in the FNAF lore, and it's something that when you mention or even adapt FNAF, you can't help but bring it up. It would be like making a movie about 
the Infinity Gauntlet and not bringing up Thanos. Like, that's how crucial to the... Or, actually, switch that around. If we, like, making a movie about Thanos, but not mentioning the Infinity Gauntlet or the Infinity Stones, it's just that crucial to the plot and the overall lore that if you were to do an entire trilogy of movies and not at least make a reference to it, you might as well not have done it at all. I still like the idea of first one is that there are these are three standalone movies and Michael, Mike, sorry, Michael, William Afton is the only thread connecting it. Maybe we go back to the past and we see him, we sort of get hints that he's like this creepy employee or something like that, security guard, and because of that, that causes them to okay. attack. Who is the security guard in FNAF 2 uh, that you play as? Jeremy uh, something? There was two. Uh, I can't there remember. was Jeremy and Fritz Smith. I think, yeah, Jeremy, I remember, was the victim of the Bite of 87. I believe so. I, again, I think if they are to do a trilogy, they should dial up the intensity as they go on. You have Marvel doing their first R-rated movie with Deadpool coming out. Yeah. And Werewolf by Night is, some see it as an R-rated product. Technically, all the Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Punisher, Iron Fist, Luke Cage, all the Netflix shows are MCU, so those are R-rated. Even the DCEU, as much as nobody likes to talk about it, it had its fair share of R-rated movies in The Suicide Squad, the, specified the, so it's the James Gunn version, Birds of Prey, and the extended edition, and Zack Snyder's Justice League, and even the extended edition of Batman v Superman was R-rated. And Blumhouse isn't stupid, like, they know they're, want me to take it? Yeah, please. <laughs> Blumhouse isn't stupid. They know their audience. They know that these kids aren't be, going to be kids forever and that there's come, going to come a point where they want to have all their cards on the table, not pull their punches. And if my experience is seeing Logan and Joker or anything, an R rating is not going to stop the parents from bringing their kids. Really? <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. To the credit of the kids, though, they shut up for the entire movie. You know, that they were severely traumatized. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. I don't think the kids in this movie will be traumatized by anything. If I was a parent, I would probably be like, okay, maybe don't bring your kids to this one. I mean, there's nothing, especially the zoom in on the that one shot of seeing the spring go in Will and Rapid's oh, yeah. body. Like, even even though it's not very graphic, just the, oh, like, your imagination fails in the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is... Uh... That is an interesting scene. When he put on the head, though, I was half expecting, like, the gears and that to sort of clamp around him. Because aren't there, like, spring locks in the head of the suit as well, or is it just the body? I believe there should be spring locks in the head as well. But, uh, they, I think they just needed him to put the head back on. So they just needed, like, because they wanted to re reveal it was, like, who William Afton really was. Mm-hmm. But, like, they didn't really have, like, a good way outside of, like, just removing the helmet. Mm -hmm. So they needed him to just put it back on. Like I said, I don't think they'll adapt all the games because Vanessa, in the game, she's a very recent character. In fact, Security Breach is the one that she just got added to, right? Technically, yes, but technically, no. I mean, I could see Security Breach work as a standalone. Like, if they wanted to... I don't know, if they wanted to make a mini-series of, like, the untold stories of FNAF, like FNAF 4, this location, that kind of thing, I could see how it could work, but they kind of dug themselves in a hole with Vanessa because while they've introduced her as the daughter of a notorious ser serial killer, she's also one of the good guys of this franchise, or the good guys in this movie. So changing that will take a lot of convincing and story to do. Actually, if you go with, like, the prequel plan idea for, like, the second movie, mm -hmm. you could incorporate, like, elements of Sister Location and, like, Vanessa being, like, willing, I guess, is the mo most accurate word in uh, William's plots. Mm -hmm. As, like, if you said it in the past, you can have, like, the Afton's workshop, like, under uh, his house as it is in Sister Location where he's like designing the animatronics and whatnot. That could be the elements of Sister Location, while also like bringing in Vanessa as like, whether a knowing or willing participant to uh, assist, I guess, in the murders. That could make sense. I mean, in the newest Scream movies, um, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen it, one oh, of the no, main characters. One of the main characters is the daughter of the main one of the main killers from the original Scream. 
And no, it is not William. L it is not William Lillard. L William, uh, William Lillard. Ah, uh, I can't speak tonight. You know the guy who played William Afton. It is not the actor who plays him. That is Matthew Lillard. I was gonna say, I'm pretty sure that's like the second or third time you mispronounced his name today. <laughs> uh, Matthew Lillard, the character. Okay, in the new Speed movies, the daughter, the main characters, one of the main characters is the daughter of one of the original killers from Scream. And no, it is not Matthew Lillard's character. One take. There we go. <laughs> well, yeah. we'll use it. I think that's everything we've covered so far. Um, I feel like if uh, I'm fi this movie is out on streaming, so. Might check it out there somewhere. On the, it's probably already there's probably a file on it that's been pirated already. So. Oh, probably. <laughs> yeah, so I'll probably give more more thoughts on it in an in-depth review. But this has been a another movie-going vlog. Thanks for coming along, and see you in the next one. Catch you on the flip side. Later.